I want to welcome you all to today's webinar titled, What is the Right to Housing? Uh, my name is Joshua Evans. I am a professor of human geography at the University of Alberta. I am also the research lead uh, for the Affordable Housing Solutions Lab, an initiative supported by the City of Edmonton. The Affordable Housing Solutions Lab was created to act as a catalyst for expanding the supply, diversity, and accessibility of safe, affordable, and adequate housing choices in Edmonton, Alberta, and beyond. Myself, the Solutions Lab, and the University are situated on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Personally, as a settler, I want to acknowledge the teaching of Indigenous friends and colleagues who have enriched my own understanding of housing and home here on this land. And this teaching and learning is of relevance to today's topic. The right to housing and this is an idea that is inextricably linked to land to power and to the law this is actually our second webinar on the right to housing uh, this past february we hosted a webinar titled what are your rights when renting and in this webinar our presenters uh, shared their views on the right to housing as well as personal experiences living in rental housing here in Edmonton. But coming out of that webinar, we saw the need for uh, some broader reflection and some broader conversation regarding the right to housing, uh, particularly how this idea is being interpreted in Canada and how it can be used by individuals and organizations to achieve some systemic change in the housing sector. And that brings us to today's um, webinar and our two guest speakers, which we're really thrilled to have with us. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to introduce these two individuals and then we'll jump right into their presentations. So first is Michelle Biss, Project Manager of the National Right to Housing Network, an allied network housed at the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. Uh, as an expert in economic and social rights, she has presented at several United Nations treaty body reviews and at Canadian parliamentary committees on issues related to poverty. Prior to her work at the CAEH, Michelle was the policy director and human rights lawyer at Canada Without Poverty. She has extensive professional experience working for marginalized groups, particularly women, persons with disabilities, newcomers, and Indigenous persons through casework, research, and community education. She is a, a human rights lawyer and was called to the Ontario Bar in 2014. Welcome, Michelle. I'll now just introduce our second speaker, uh, Alyssa Brierle, Executive Director and General Counsel, the Center for Equality Rights and Accommodation. Alyssa is a lawyer and public policy professional with over a decade of experience in public policy, legal service, research, and operations management. Prior to joining CERA, Alyssa served as the Health, Social Justice and Labour Policy Advisor to the President of the Treasury Board of Ontario and as the Director of Policy to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Alyssa has, has also worked as a Legal Research and Communications Advisor to the UN Special Repertoire on the Right to Food as a lawyer and policy analyst at the Ontario College of Teachers and completed her articles at Tories LLP. Alyssa holds a BA from the University of Waterloo, an MA in political science from New York University, a juries doctor from Osgoode Hall Law School, and is completing a PhD in political science at York University focused on the right to food in India. Wow, welcome Alyssa. Both impressive bios and I'm really pleased and excited to have you both here uh, to present to us. Thank you for your for um, your time today. Following the presentations, we'll open up for some um, questions and conversation. Thanks so much. I think that I'm starting us off. Um, so thank you everyone for the invitation to be here. I know Alyssa and I are both very excited to be talking to folks about the right to housing. I am joining you today from the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, so here in the city of Ottawa, and as Joshua very, um, very kindly started off with, uh, with our bios, I'm uh, working with the National Right to Housing Network, where I'm the project manager, uh, where I've been set for some time. Um, and uh, in my role, uh, my role is to um, 
to really ensure that we're monitoring the creation of the infrastructure for the National Housing Strategy Act, so our right to housing legislation, and to also start building systemic cases to bring forward to the federal housing advocate. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here and to be talking about the right to housing. So just kind of starting out with the agenda. So we have a, a pretty packed agenda today. Uh, Alyssa and I are hoping to give folks a really great overview of what the right to housing is, um, where it came from, um, what it will look like through Canada's new claiming mechanisms through the National Housing Strategy Act, our new right to housing legislation. And as well, talking about the ways that folks can actually claim the right to housing um, by marginalized and under-resourced groups and, and others in Canada to ensure that we're achieving systemic change. So very much on the point of what Joshua was saying, that we're hoping that this presentation, we can really give some context to folks about how we can use this as a tool to make really large systemic change. I'm going to start really, really high level here, so bear with me. There's a number of international agreements that Canada has signed on to that recognize the right to housing. We signed on to a lot of these treaties and really we saw um, the, um, the um, coming together of folks across the world after the Second World War to create a human rights system, to create the United Nations, to create a number of treaties. And around the time that Canada signed on to the UN Declaration of Human Rights back in 1954, you might notice if you take a look at it that there's this reference to civil and political rights like the right to freedom of expression, the right to vote, freedom of assembly. And those are considered on equal footing as economic, social, and cultural rights, like the right to food, the right to housing, the right to health. But somewhere along the way, um, probably in about the 1980s, we relegated economic, social, and cultural rights, like the right to housing, to being rights that are aspirational, and civil and political rights, like the right to vote, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, to being ones that were really inherent to our identity within Canada, to the rights that we protect, to the rights that we recognize, that you can fight in a courtroom, that you can have protected when you're, when you're living in this country. And this is actually really quite strange. Um, while across the world, we saw this kind of relegation of economic, social, cultural rights around that time. In Canada, we really, really um, made that divide significant. So for example, if you look at our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you see intrinsic recognition of things like freedom of expression, um, whereas you don't see much reference to economic, social, and cultural rights. Now I'll tell folks, for those who are really interested in the charter, in um, our constitution, into litigation, really interestingly, around the time that the charter was being created, advocates for economic, social, and cultural rights were actually assured that particular sections of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, particularly section seven, which is for life, liberty, and security of the person, and um, section 15 for equality and non-discrimination, that those would inherently protect economic, social, and cultural rights like the right to housing. But sadly, in practice, we really haven't seen that. And then I really wanted to point out to folks, just I have a list of a couple of interesting covenants here. 1976, Canada ratified the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. That in some ways, I think, is considered kind of the, the bread and butter of the right to housing, of international human rights related to economic, social, and cultural rights. And there you have section 11, which really zeroes in on the right to housing. And then we also have covenants that regard people um, from particular marginalized groups. So for example, you have the International Covenant on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was just ratified in 2010, so pretty recently. Um, and that also includes a reference to the right to housing. So we've signed on to these international human rights agreements. Um, what do they actually mean? So what I really, really want to leave folks with today, um, and I think we'll hit on this in a couple of different points within this presentation, is that the right to housing isn't just an idea. 
The right to housing is something that has a substantive legal framework. We have a number of authorities at the United Nations level. Uh, we have treaty bodies. We have these general comments that these treaty bodies have come out to really suss out what the details of the right to housing and other rights are. We have things like special rapporteurs who are experts across the country who, um, who protect and assess um, and evaluate how countries are doing with it, it, it with um, regard to compliance to these rights. So we have all these authorities that have really sussed out what the key principles are. So a couple of these key principles I'd like to um, point folks to. One is this idea of progressive realization. Now, this is one that um, is really important for the right to housing. It's the idea that um, governments in adhering to the right to housing and other economic, social, cultural rights must always be moving forward with rights. And that can be done, through, for example, through budgetary decisions, through policy decisions, that all of those things in conjunction with one another make up progressive realization. They make up the realization of a right. Second is this principle that I think is really important around a maximum of available resources. So um, all countries that have signed on to covenants like the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights have this have to meet this standard of ensuring that a maximum of available resources are allocated towards human rights obligations like the right to housing. Now, this is uh, particularly important for countries that are very wealthy, like Canada, who will be measured at a very, very high standard in comparison to other countries. And last but not least, of course, there's this principle of equality and non-discrimination inherent within the right to housing and international human rights law. This idea that we know that disproportionately particular groups of people in this country, for example, Indigenous persons in particular, um, single mothers, uh, persons with disabilities, all of these particular groups disproportionately bear the brunt of Canada's housing crisis, are represented um, far and above in numbers of those experiencing homelessness or experiencing inadequate housing. And what I really want to highlight here is this point that often when we're talking about human rights and the right to housing, we kind of defer to provincial human rights schemes, right? So when you think about the right to housing, you think about human rights, often I find um, when talking to folks, they think about ways that, for example, a landlord might discriminate against a tenant because of sexual orientation or because of race, um, or um, perhaps someone is evicted because of disability. Right? And all of those pieces are really important components of international human rights, of the right to housing. But what Alyssa and I are going to be talking about today includes that, but also goes above that, these ideas around progressive realization, maximum available resources. What are the standards under international human rights law that all levels of government in Canada must adhere to? So thanks for teaching us about international human rights. What does this mean in Canada? I can't go to the courts. I can't. What do I do with this information? And so um, I'm going to tell a little bit of the story of advocacy and, and what it took to get us to what is now called the National Housing Strategy Act. So um, for a long time in Canada, it was really, really hard for people to be able to access the right to housing, to hold it in their hands, to say um, either this is a systemic violation of my right to housing or this is an individual violation of the right to housing. Um, and so um, through many different means did folks try to exercise these rights. So um, one particular example I want to leave folks with today, just to kind of tell the story of Canada's um, extreme opposition to the right to housing, is uh, the Tanu Jaja case. So the Tani Jaja case was back in about 2010 or so, um, and we saw one institutional applicant, which was actually the Center for Equality, Rights, and Accommodation, where Alyssa is the executive director. And I always my claim to fame is that many, many, many years ago, as a as an articling student, I actually articled at CIRA. Um, but many, many moons ago, CIRA filed an application at the Ontario Superior Court. Um, that uh, named the federal government and the provincial government and said that the government had violated Section 7 and Section 15. So you might recall those sections I was talking about earlier in the charter. 
that we had violated the charter because we had failed to create a national housing strategy. We had failed to progressively realize our obligations under international human rights law and really take the right to housing seriously. And I just want to be clear that um, for those in the legal community, this might seem like a really novel application. It might seem kind of out there. But the reality is, is that if you look to other countries and some of the litigation that's done in other countries, this kind of litigation is actually quite normal. Um, it's really quite standard. And so, um, despite the fact that about 10,000 pages, 9,000, 10,000 pages of evidence were filed, a number of experts were lined up to come forward, um, we saw the levels, both, both the provincial and federal government, file what's called a motion to strike. So in litigation, you use a motion to strike in those cases where a situation is so vexatious and frivolous that it should not be heard. Um, it uh, And... Shockingly, we had the um, the court of first instance at the Superior Court agree with that motion and say, we're not even going to hear this. This isn't going to even appear in front of us. And what's really important here, and I want to leave folks with um, this part of the narrative, is that from that process, we didn't get a decision saying, no, the right to housing doesn't stand. No, the charter doesn't protect the right to housing. What we got was a, we're not even going to listen to it. We're not even going to entertain the idea that people experiencing homelessness, that people experiencing Canada's housing crisis have constitutionally protected rights under our charter. Um, deeply, deeply, deeply problematic. This was appealed to the Ontario Court of Appeal. And in a two to one decision, there was one dissent. The dissent was really great. <laughs> um, but the uh, in the overriding decision, they said, no, nope, we agree with the judge. This is a frivolous and vexatious claim. We're not even going to hear it. And then it went on to the Supreme Court and leave was denied. So really important, here we see actions by the government to make sure it's not even heard in the courts. We see this pushback and we've seen kind of this trend of Canada um, saying, no, we do not recognize the right to housing in many instances. We in fact have seen it. Um, there's an instrument called the Optional Protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. Alyssa's, I think, going to dig a little bit more into the covenant stuff soon. Um, but uh, but just an interesting to note for folks that that's a mechanism by which people can exercise uh, individual claims. And we saw Canada push really hard back on the language within the optional protocol. And then Canada said, oh, and now we're not going to sign it. So it meant that they watered it down for a whole bunch of other countries to sign on. And then they stepped out of the process. So we see this real systemic um, pushback on the right to housing. Um, and we've also, you know, seen ways in which we've used different UN mechanisms, um, had special rapporteurs push back on Canada, gone to treaty body reviews of Canada, and from those gotten things called concluding observations, which are recommendations for Canada. Um, and again, we hadn't seen much movement then. So in about 2017, the government of Canada said that they were going to start recognizing the right to housing. You see some language around the right to housing, a rights-based approach in Canada's national housing strategy of 2017. And uh, within that, we also saw a potential commitment that there would be legislation to recognize the right to housing. So in about 2018, shortly after that, um, a few folks from the advocacy community got together and actually drafted up draft legislation to say this is what civil society believes this legislation should look like. Um, there was a whole lot of negotiation with government actors. And uh, lo and behold, in early 2019, we saw the very first iteration of the National Housing Strategy Act. Now, I want to point out here what is really interesting about this advocacy story is that the very first iteration of the National Housing Strategy Act wasn't very good. <laughs> it didn't really include the mechanisms that we needed. Um, it was, in fact, quite disappointing. But 
um, through a process that very, very rarely um, happens through um, some pushback, some engagement with the finance committee on um, because it was it was protected by the budget. It, it was included in the Budget Implementation Act through some back and forth. We actually got the language changed in the National Housing Strategy Act and the proposal for the mechanisms we wanted to see changed. And I say this, I tell this story because Alyssa and I are going to be talking a lot about the National Housing Strategy Act in this presentation. And I really want to emphasize the fact that this comes from civil society. This comes from rights claimants. This is the um, pinnacle of our fight for the right to housing to be recognized. And it's a real opportunity for us to change legal systems within Canada. I'm going to pop over to Alyssa very shortly. Um, but uh, I just really want to emphasize this point. Um, and this is pulled from the UN Special Rapporteur's website. And this is this point of the right to housing is not just a rallying cry. Cry. It is. It builds movements. It's important. It's a principle. But it offers concrete standards that can be implemented and measured for progress. So the right to housing has a legal framework, um, and we have this legal framework as protected in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And it's this new legal system that we can start to apply through um, through these new mechanisms. All right, so next up is the right to housing in Canada. Um, so just to kind of highlight, um, I spoke to a couple of these concepts a little bit earlier today, um, but I really want to highlight, um, and I'll, uh, I'll maybe um, cheat us out of one of the aha moments, but in the National Housing Strategy Act, as Alyssa will, will talk about in just one moment, we actually see language that recognizes the, um, the National Housing Strategy Act as the instrument by which the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights is exercised. And so what that means is that we can use pieces of this normative legal framework from international human rights law to interpret exactly what the right to housing means. And so from that, we have a couple of key concepts. So one is this idea of progressive realization. I spoke about this a little bit earlier, but just wanted to emphasize this a little bit more. And this is the idea that states that have signed on to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights um, are committed to achieving the full realization of rights in the covenant by all appropriate means, including legislative measures. And as I said earlier, that countries like Canada um, with a high amount of resources will be held to a very different standard than countries with scarce resources. So for example, homelessness, which is considered an urgent violation of the right to housing, um, homelessness in a, in a country that is as affluent as Canada is considered completely unacceptable and must be addressed as a violation of the right to housing. And just a quick moment here, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, I think I had mentioned this a little bit earlier, but just to highlight that um, Canada had been told a number of times um, that it needed to um, move forward with the right to housing, to make it justiciable, to make, it, make a way that folks could claim the right to housing, to hold it in their hands. Um, and in fact, uh, civil society has been engaging with a number of mechanisms for many, many years. But uh, importantly, we've been engaging with the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which reviews Canada. It's supposed to be every five years. It often plays out to be more like every 10 years. Um, but we have concluding observations that can be really, really helpful in understanding the context of international human rights law. Um, and those reviews happened in 1993, 1998, 2006, 2016. And also, we know that the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing, um, who ha has issued several communications to Canada and really helped us understand the right to housing. Um, currently, uh, we have a Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing who's been appointed since, I think, May of 2020. Um, but prior to this, uh, folks might know about the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing because she was Canadian um, and made a very popular documentary folks might have seen called Push, whose name is Leila. Lani Farha. Uh, but the UN Special Rapporteur, both Leilani, her predecessors, and, and the newer Special Rapporteur have made many, many communications to Canada, um, pushing Canada on implementation in relationship to the right to housing. <laughs> 
And two of the overriding concerns that have come through in these recommendations, both from the CSCR committee, from the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, and multiple UN special rapporteurs, is that Canada must recognize the right to housing through Canadian law and that we need a rights-based national housing strategy that includes measurable goals, timelines, consultation, um, collaboration with affected communities, a complaints procedure, transparent accountability mechanisms, and um, in keeping with the covenant standards. So from there, I'm passing on to Alyssa. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, and, and I'm going to pick up um, uh, the conversation at uh, the National Housing Strategy Act, which Michelle has mentioned a few times now, and I, I, I'll just refer to it as the NHSA for short, uh, because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and this was a piece of legislation that was adopted by Parliament in June of 2019. And as Michelle mentioned, it's the first piece of uh, Canadian federal legislation uh, to explicitly recognize and commit to implementing a right under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is very exciting. It recognizes that the right to adequate housing is a fundamental human right affirmed under international law, and it commits the federal government to the progressive realization of the right to adequate housing as it's recognized in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So the government has committed in legislation to realizing the right to housing as it's understood in international law. So the question then is, of course, well, what does the right to housing under international law mean? Uh, and and um, it's you know certainly not simply four walls and a roof. Uh, it's the economic, social, and, and cultural right to adequate housing and shelter. And that means housing that meets certain basic conditions. Uh, and there's a number of them. Uh, bear with me, I'm gonna speak about each of them um, uh, at a very high level so that we all sort of understand the, the sort of basic elements of the right to housing. So affordability is one of them. Uh, and, and this means uh, housing, it's not considered adequate if the cost of it threatens or com compromises the enjoyment of other human rights, such as food, health, or education. The second element is accessibility. So housing is not considered adequate if the specific needs of disadvantaged and marginalized groups are not taken into account. Security of tenure is the, the sort of third element. Uh, housing is not considered adequate if its occupants don't have a degree of uh, security of tenure, which guarantees legal protection against forced evictions, harassments, and, and other threats. Uh, it requires availability of services, materials, facilities, and infrastructure. So housing would not be considered adequate if its occupants don't have access uh, to safe drinking water, adequate sanitation, energy for cooking, heating, food storage, or refuse disposal. Habitability is another requirement. So housing would not be considered adequate if it doesn't guarantee the physical safety or provide adequate space uh, for occupants, as well as uh, protection against the cold, the heat, uh, rain, wind, other elements, uh, as well as threats to health and, and other structural hazards. The sixth principle is uh, location. So housing would not be considered adequate if it's cut off from things like employment opportunities, healthcare services, schools, childcare centers, and other social facilities, or if it's located in polluted or dangerous areas. And finally, housing uh, must be culturally adequate. Uh, so it wouldn't be considered adequate uh, if it doesn't respect and take into account the expression of cultural identity uh, for the occupants. So fundamentally, the right to housing comes down to a place to call home that allows someone to live in security and dignity. The national, the NHSA legislation provides some important new mechanisms that we can all utilize to hold the federal government accountable. Uh, the minister is required to develop and adopt a national housing strategy based on a rights-based approach to housing. Uh, and that as well um, could use a bit of unpacking. So, um, you know, what makes uh, an approach to housing a rights-based approach? Uh, so there's a few things that I'll, I'll just mention here as well. So first and, and foremost, a rights-based approach to housing would require rights-based decision-making. And so that's uh, the idea that uh, in decision-making, human rights would be a primary consideration and take precedence over other factors. And it would also mean that decision-making processes go beyond consultation uh, and meaningfully engage uh, 
individuals and communities who are directly affected by those decisions. A rates-based approach to housing would also require setting goals, targets, and timelines for the reduction and elimination of homelessness, as Michelle mentioned, as well for ensuring adequate housing for everyone over time. So again, that progressive realization of the right to adequate housing. And it also means that specific policies and programs would be in place to meet those goals. A rights-based approach would involve evidence-based monitoring, using high quality data, um, ideally disaggregated by race, gender, age, income, and other um, criteria so that uh, the impacts of uh, policies and programs on particular groups could be measured. And uh, of course, uh, housing policies would be designed, implemented, and monitored with the participation and in fact leadership of individuals and communities that are directly affected by inadequate housing and homelessness by civil society organizations and other stakeholders. A rights-based approach would also include independent mechanisms through which the right to adequate housing can be monitored, claimed, and enforced. Uh, and we'll get to, to that in a moment. And finally, um, uh, another sort of criterion of uh, rights-based approaches uh, would be the uh, requirement of various government departments and agencies to work together across silos to coordinate their action and resources in ways that would enhance the right to housing. So there's a, a number of mechanisms that are established in the NHSA uh, to achieve all of these goals. One of those mechanisms is the National Housing Council. And uh, the council is established uh, sort of at a high level uh, for the purpose of furthering the housing policy uh, and the national housing strategy. And uh, again, at a high level, they provide advice to the minister on the effectiveness of the national housing strategy. Uh, and they're comprised of um, the president of CMHC, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which is the uh, government agency tasked with the implementation of the national housing strategy. Uh, there are two deputy ministers and the federal housing advocate who are part of the National Housing Council. And I'll explain what the federal housing advocate is in a moment. And there's up to an additional 15 uh, members who are appointed and uh, represent uh, various vulnerable groups, uh, it would include individuals with lived experience of housing need and homelessness, uh, and with an eye to making sure that the composition of the council reflects the diversity of Canadian society. And of course, uh, individuals who have expertise in human rights and can, can take that um, human rights based approach uh, and that lens and apply it to the advice that they're providing to the minister. And then uh, uh, the council itself is uh, supported by um, CMHC and, and there's a staff complement that um, within CMHC that provides sort of administrative uh, background support to the, the council. So uh, the other um, significant mechanism that has been established in the NHSA is the Federal Housing Advocate. And uh, this is an individual who will occupy a, um, a position uh, specifically designed to um, do a, a number of things under the Act. Uh, this individual will monitor the implementation of the progressive realization of the right to housing, uh, and in particular, considering the impact of um, uh, the government's housing policy on vulnerable groups. Uh, this individual will also monitor progress in meeting the goals and the timelines uh, attached to any of the, the policies, programs, and the, the national housing strategy. They have a mandate to uh, research and investigate systemic housing issues that relate to uh, all elements of the housing system. Uh, and in particular, they have a mandate to receive uh, submissions from groups on systemic violations of the right to housing, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, through all of this work, they are um, uh, tasked with consulting with and working closely with affected communities and civil society organizations. Uh, I mentioned uh, the submissions uh, that they can receive on systemic housing issues. And they also have a, a mandate to advise the minister and uh, as part of that sit on the National Housing Council. They are an independent uh, uh, human rights expert. Uh, but they are housed uh, housed at and supported by uh, staff at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And uh, so a couple of additional pieces related to the advocate. Uh, 
they do have um, uh, the mandate to receive submissions on systemic issues from uh, groups or individuals uh, related to uh, systemic housing issues. And when they receive those submissions, there's a, there's a couple things they can do with those. They do have the uh, ability to uh, conduct a review of any issue that is brought to their attention. Uh, and if they do that, they uh, they can uh, draft a report uh, setting out their findings and any recommendations um, specific to matters over which Parliament has jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, within the federal mandate uh, to further housing policy or the national housing strategy or the progressive realization of the right to adequate housing. And when they do that, uh, the minister needs to respond, uh, required in the legislation to respond to any uh, any such report by the federal housing advocate uh, within 120 days. So there's a sort of a, an accountability um, piece within, um, within that uh, interaction between the, the federal housing advocate and the minister. The, the second thing that the federal housing advocate can do when uh, something, when a systemic housing issue is brought to their attention is they can actually uh, request that the National Housing Council uh, establish a review panel to uh, hold a hearing into that particular issue. And the review panel uh, would be comprised of three members of the National Housing Council and uh, and, and there is a, a requirement that in so doing, they recognize uh, the importance of lived, lived experience and human rights expertise. So in terms of choosing those three members, they do need to take that into account. And when that panel is struck, uh, the panel is required to hold a hearing uh, that provides the public uh, and, and in particular in uh, members of affected, affected communities and groups with expertise in human rights and housing, an opportunity to participate in that process. So that's really important. And they're also required to submit a report to the minister uh, that sets out their opinion and any recommendations that they have coming out of that hearing. And again, specific to the matters over which parliament has jurisdiction. So things that are within the federal government's uh, mandate. And again, the minister has to respond uh, and is required by legislation to respond to that report. Uh, within 120 days of receiving it, and they have to table that response before the House of Commons uh, and the Senate, uh, which is an additional piece of uh, accountability there. So that that report then becomes part of the official parliamentary record. So in terms of the legal status of the right to housing in Canada, um, oh, we talked. Michelle talked about this a little bit um, at the at the beginning of the presentation. So the right to housing that I that we just talked about under the National Housing Strategy Act and under international human rights law is not, at this point, um, is not directly enforceable through Canadian courts. However, what, what is the case is that when courts are interpreting how Canadian law um, ought to apply uh, and when governments are making uh, decisions such as, such as those related to eviction, uh, we need to consider human rights, uh, international human rights, in the context of those decisions. In addition to that, uh, the rights found in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, also need to be interpreted consistently with international human rights, including the right to housing. Uh, and governments should promote rather than oppose uh, interpretations of the Charter that align with international human rights law. Um, so, for example, evictions that threaten the security. Um, an individual's security and, and put life at risk uh, have been found to violate the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, in particular Section 7. And tribunals or boards applying uh, laws that relate to arrears and evictions uh, should certainly strive to avoid violating international human rights and the right to housing uh, as they consider those questions. Uh, and should exercise discretion not to evict where an eviction would violate international human rights norms. That particular question uh, has not yet, um, and I'm looking at Michelle, has not yet come to um, uh, a tribunal or court for a decision, but that would be the way that a court would need to sort of approach the issue in order to comply with the obligation to um, ensure that charter interpretations are not in violation of international human rights law. And so we've talked uh, talked a little bit about this uh, already, but just uh, just to make sure uh, I've covered off everything, when we talk about right, a rights-based approach under the National Housing Strategy Act, uh, 
Um, again, affected communities uh, must be considered and treated as rights holders and empowered to identify and address key systemic issues that um, deny them the right to housing as it is understood and, and defined in international human rights law. Uh, systemic discrimination and marginalization of marginalized groups in particular need to be considered. Uh, meaningful engagement with communities and participatory hearings uh, are required to give voice to affected groups uh, who uh, can and should be supported by civil society advocates and experts and provided the space and opportunity to, to have that support. Uh, the NHSA is fundamentally uh, a transformational piece of legislation that is focused on systemic change. Uh, and the government has a duty to ensure effective remedies uh, uh, as part of its commitment to the principles of the NHSA. And the uh, Federal Housing Advocate and the uh, review panels, uh, the National Housing Council, all of the mechanisms um, that we just talked about are in place to ensure that the government is, um, in, it is providing for those uh, effective remedies. So I think this is the, um, the place where I hand it back to you, Michelle. Um, so at this point in the presentation, um, and, and I just wanted to flag, I think uh, a few folks just looking at the list of those who are joining the call um, have maybe even heard Alyssa and I talk about the right to housing in this context a few times. Um, just a few months ago, we did a, a meeting talking about systemic issues in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Um, and really trying to dig in, we're doing a lot of work right now to really dig in on what are those systemic issues that folks want the federal housing advocate to assess first? What, are, what, is, what does it look like um, when we kind of all come together and um, bring forward these systemic claims? So the first one I just wanted to flag for folks um, that we've been working on together. Um, uh, the first one is in relationship to, um, to evictions and arrears. So uh, just last, um, last fall, uh, we did a couple of consultations, CIRA and the National Right to Housing Network. We did a couple of meetings with, um, with experts across the country to talk about the fact that we have an increasing number of people who have fallen into arrears during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, housing was already unaffordable before the pandemic, but that has only increased as people lose their jobs or their jobs become more precarious. They lose hours because of the pandemic. Um, and what we attempted to do in our very first National Housing Strategy Act submission is talk about what we had heard from rights claimants, apply international human rights law, and then we came up actually with a remedy that we would propose, which we called the Residential Tenant Support Benefit, which is a benefit that the federal government could, um, I think, very easily implement to be able to stop people from falling in the precipice of um, evictions into homelessness following the, the pandemic. I just wanted to kind of flag here, um, this is really important um, to think about in the context of, of the right to housing and international human rights, because if we had started with just a Canadian law perspective and not with the National Housing Strategy Act, I feel like we would have immediately come to the conclusion that um, evictions and arrears fall under provincial and territorial jurisdiction, not federal jurisdiction. But instead, if we start with this process of talking to rights claimants, identifying the issue, and then applying international human rights law. So, for example, in this slide, you'll see some of the instructions from the guidance note of the Special Rapporteur on the right to housing in the context of rent arrears during the pandemic. So applying um, different principles like the burden of the response of the pandemic has to be shared across society in a fair and equitable manner, that renters and homeowners should not emerge from the pandemic overburdened with housing related debt. And third of all, that the financial burden shouldered by banks, financial institutions, and corporate landlords must be proportionate to their resources. Looking at these principles, we have a much better idea um, looking at international human rights law and the way, as Alyssa was talking earlier, about how um, tribunals, decision makers must be considering whether someone is going to fall into homelessness for an eviction, for example, due to arrears. When we apply those principles, we can really see the way that the federal government can be implicated here. And then we see the way that they can um, come through with a potential remedy through a program like a residential support benefit. And then just here, I'm going to flag 
uh, briefly that um, there's a number of other issues that we know um, will be really, really critical for folks uh, coming up to submissions to the federal housing advocate. Um, I don't know if Alyssa mentioned this in the presentation or if I did either. We do not have a federal housing advocate yet. <laughs> yes, which is bad because it has been two years since this legislation was passed and yet we do not have a federal housing advocate. That said, I think it's going to come really, really soon. And what I will say is that staff at the Office of the Federal Housing Advocate at the Canadian Human Rights Commission seem to be very, very well prepared for their mandate um, and have been doing a lot of work with civil society. So I have high, high hopes. Um, once we do have an advocate, though, we will have the opportunity to start making systemic claims and start bringing these forward to the advocate and using this system. So a couple of key issues that I know um, Alyssa and I certainly have our minds on, and I'm sure that folks in the call do too. You might see some repetition here if you if you've joined any of our meetings in the past. Um, one is just the disproportionate effect of the housing crisis on particular marginalized groups. So persons with disabilities, absolutely. Um, implications for accessibility requirements, for example, in programs funded through the National Housing Strategy, looking at women and girls and gender diverse persons and the way in which um, we're not adequately measuring impact of programs and funding on, um, on outcomes for women, girls, gender diverse persons. Um, certainly the fact that Indigenous persons are so disproportionately experiencing this housing crisis on and off reserve. We don't have an urban, um, urban rule and northern Indigenous housing strategy. Um, I will, I could keep going on in the interest of time, I won't, but as we know, marginalized groups, um, the ones listed there and many others disproportionately face the impact, um, negative impacts of a, a housing system that's built on a legacy of colonialism, racism, and sexism. So how do we think of ways that we can build systemic claims that really address these things and provide potential solutions um, long-term to address that systemic failure? I talked a little bit about evictions and arrears, um, but another one that I know came up, um, certainly in the context of, of our Alberta discussion not long ago, was a lack of programmatic support um, for people who are transitioning from government institutions into homelessness. So, for example, um, when uh, young people age out of the child welfare system, a lack of programmatic support. When persons leave um, prisons, a lack of programmatic support and just, and just going straight into homelessness. Um, and as well with um, hospital discharges and lack of support between our healthcare system um, and that falls into homelessness. And last but not least, a lot of our thinking has also had to do with first voice advocates. And how are we making sure that those voices are integrated in decision making, that we're balancing power? Um, one issue I'll flag here um, that always comes up in our discussions is the big one of financialization of housing. So we know, for example, real estate investment trusts, other financial actors just carry this tremendous amount of power within housing systems. Um, and we're seeing this in the trend of run evictions, of, um, of folks being, you know, being evicted based on a business model of, um, of being in affordable housing and then a large corporate actor purchasing that housing and evicting people to build high priced condos. We're seeing, you know, communities that are just empty. The implications of financialization are really significant. And so part of our thinking in this is really about how do we make sure that the people who are experiencing the housing crisis have power? How do we use the right to housing to shift power back into those hands? Um, so that's a lot of the thinking in terms of these systemic cases. And I will maybe uh, wrap up there. Alyssa and I have a couple of, of key questions, but maybe to ask us some questions as well. Thank you so much, Michelle and Alyssa. That was wonderful. Um, Laura has a question here. Any question would might be what would a systemic claim look like, perhaps through a theoretical example? We see some of these claims primarily going through civil courts right now. Um, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to to start off and and um, get the ball rolling on it. So, I, so what would a systemic claim look like? I, I mean, I think high level. It's it, it's interesting. Michelle and I were just chatting a little bit about this before the uh, before the presentation. So, systemic can mean a few different things. Um, so maybe like just to just to 
state the obvious. What it doesn't mean is a claim, an issue that applies to a specific individual. That's, that is an issue that needs to kind of uh, go through the um, other dispute resolution mechanisms that are available, whether it's the landlord tenant board, whether it's the, you know, human, human rights, sorry, I'm speaking, uh, I'm using Ontario language here, but the landlord tenant sort of dispute mechanisms or the human rights dispute mechanisms like the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, uh, or if it relates to federal issue, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, um, uh, and, and potentially even a, a court. Uh, so it doesn't mean a dispute that relates to uh, an individual. It could mean, uh, it could mean a few things. Uh, a, a, an issue that applies to a large number of people. Uh, it could mean an issue that is a result of the way that our systems and processes and policies and um, programs, et cetera, are structured. So it's a kind of a, uh, a, a tricky issue to solve, I guess, for lack of a better term. I, I think a lot about uh, financialization, um, which is, uh, you know, it refers to the way in which housing has become... Um, effectively, uh, for lack of a better uh, descriptor, um, more of an asset class than a place where people live uh, and and uh, has become um, uh, more of an investment than anything else. And, and what that has, you know, what that results in is housing that becomes effectively a speculative investment that um, is traded uh, like any other speculative investment, like a, bo a bond or a stock or um, uh, other sort of financial instruments, um, and as a result, becomes increasingly unaffordable and out of reach for for average people. That is a result of uh, very complex systems and processes and policies and programs. A lot of gaps between systems, programs, policies, etc. So that would be um, that would be a, a, a systemic issue, uh, an example of a systemic issue. Um, uh, so those those are sort of the two things that come to mind: issues that affect a, a large number of people, and issues that are uh, you know a result of our um, the way that our systems are structured. Um, one that we spent some time, uh, we being the National Right to Housing Network and CIRA, uh, spent quite a bit of time working on is the issue of um, uh, uh, evictions, the, the sort of pending large number of evictions that we see. Uh, facing a large number of individuals as a result of pandemic-related income losses. And so we spent some time uh, doing a series of national engagements, talking to people to understand what their thoughts were, uh, how they were experiencing the issue. We did a bit of a sort of a cross-country snapshot, a um, little bit of research uh, to see sort of how the issue is manifesting across Canada to understand it and uh, developed a, a submission uh, jointly to um, for the purpose of submitting to the Federal Housing Advocate, which of course, as Michelle mentioned, is not yet in place. So we submitted it to uh, the minister instead um, for their consideration and, and provided some um, recommendations on how to deal with this issue at a systemic level. Um, of course, each individual, like there, the um, class of individuals who are affected by the issue, um, you know, in theory, could in each individually ask for relief from their landlords. But our view is that this is such a large issue affecting so many people. Um, and it, it also relates to failures in our systems and processes to provide for people when these, these issues arise in the way that they have in the pandemic, for example, that it does necessitate uh, consideration and action by the government because of that, um, because of the nature and scale of the issue. Michelle, I don't know if you want to jump in and add anything to that. No, you did such a good job. <laughs> such a good answer. Uh, you know, what, what I might just kind of emphasize here um, is Alyssa's point about these being systemic issues. It's been so hard to fight for solutions to the big systemic issues because our courts are really built to, for individual claims. Um, and then in addition to that, when it comes to individual claims, we've really seen a discharge um, a lack of focus on the right to housing um, and recognition of of the rights of people experiencing homelessness, the housing crisis as being um, rights holders, essentially. Um, what I would just kind of emphasize here is there's also a way um, in which some of these systemic claims might, um, they might be something as big as 
This is a submission on financialization of housing. But it also might look like or we are a tenant group of people who are all being run evicted out of, um, out of an apartment building that is being converted. And we are all going to come together to make a systemic claim at the federal housing advocate level to say financialization is the big issue, but this is what's happening to us individually. Um, This is what's happening to us kind of as a collective that's affecting a large number of people. It might be a way to kind of illustrate this larger issue. And the remedies that come out of that are going to be big systemic remedies, like things like ensuring that the federal government, for example, um, maybe takes a rule like Germany and um, decides to ban um, real estate investment trusts from multifamily home purchases, right? The solutions are are going to be the really, really big systemic ones. But there, I think, will be a way that a number of applicants might come forward or rights holders individually might come forward to make a submission to say, this is an illustration of a much larger systemic issue. Thank you, Alyssa and Michelle. Kyle, I see your hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and thanks for a great presentation. Um, I get a sense that affordable housing is uh, very complex. Um, That's what I'm getting from from you, and thanks for trying to uh, make sense of it. I have a bit of a simple question, and um, that is, when we hear about announcements for um, monies, being provided to build affordable housing all of a sudden. How is that not the whole answer? I, and I don't know. I don't know how it isn't the whole answer. I just assume it isn't. <laughs> I would love to. Can I jump on this one first, Alyssa? Okay. Um, this is such an interesting question. Um, it's super interesting for me because I've been doing a lot of research with some of my colleagues into the national housing strategy um, and into some of the investments that the federal government has been making in housing. So for example, there's the new rapid housing initiative that has come out, um, which I would say objectively is a pretty good program, the rapid housing initiative, um, to build lots of affordable housing. Um What is interesting, though, I'm finding, so you might recall Alyssa and I have been talking about the fact that um, the national housing strategy, all of those funding programs, the national housing strategy must adhere to the National Housing Strategy Act. It must adhere to the right to housing. And so then if you dig a little bit deeper into that money, into the national housing strategy money, there's a few big, big red flags. So one is the fact um, that I'll flag for folks. A lot of the money that's being distributed through the national housing strategy is through two programs. One is called the Rental Construction Finance Initiative, and the other is the Co-Investment Fund. Um, and there are pro- those programs in particular, those capital programs have, for example, affordability criteria that are... Um, not affordable, (laughs) just simply, simply not affordable. The number of units that are allocated for affordable uh, housing is very, very low. In one study of one national housing strategy funded project, it was found that um, it wouldn't be affordable for 90% of Torontonian residents. So we see some big gaps in what is being considered affordable and what is being considered affordable by the government. That's the first thing. So there's some digging, I think, that needs to be done into the national housing strategy and the programs that we see therein. There's also some digging, I think, that needs to be done to figure out um, what groups of people are benefiting from the national housing strategy programs. So on its face, for example, we see this commitment, and this came out again in the um, in the most recent federal budget, there's a commitment that 25% of investment uh, in, for example, the Rapid Housing Initiative, the one, the big announcement that just came out the other day, will go to women, girls, and gender diverse persons. Now, the trick here is that the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation has no way of measuring the impact on women, girls, and gender diverse persons. And so that data just is not being collected. Um, And in fact, I've heard critique from many colleagues that, for example, in the Rapid Housing Initiative program, when folks apply to it, um, they get a score of 10. And only one of those 10 is whether a project will benefit women, girls, and gender diverse persons. It's really quite low. Um, So there you can see 
you know, it's not all shiny. <laughs> the affordable housing solutions might not be affordable. They might not actually be targeting folks. And then there's this other piece that um, um, I think it's really interesting, Alyssa, that we keep coming back to, which is the financialization point. Um, the fact that we are not regulating around financialization right now. We are not ensuring that major um, major investors are not building a business model and implementing a business model where they are purchasing affordable housing and converting it into high-priced condos. We do not regulate that. We have taken a very neoliberal approach of the market will sort itself out and it just isn't working. And the reality is, and um, I wish I had the numbers at my fingertips for this because they're um, horrifyingly stark. Um, the number of units that have been built so far through the national housing strategy that are quote affordable um, are far, far, far under the number of units that we have lost to financialization over the same period of time. So the reality is, is that when we're, we don't think of this as a whole, a, a building affordable housing, deeply, deeply, deeply important, really important. I, I would argue that that comes from the private market, for nonprofit housing, for social housing, for cooperative housing. Very important that that, that that affordable housing is purchased and built. Construction initiatives happen, but that is a small piece of the puzzle. And when we consider the neoliberal way that our housing system has been built, and unless we address things like financialization, like who is this affordable housing being built for, like um, is it actually affordable? Um, is it accessible? That's another key question. Unless we think about them in this larger way and really make sure that we're creating programs that are addressing those needs and not just the need to just build, um, then what are we creating? <laughs> we actually, in the long run, might be losing out on housing um, instead of increasing the number of units that are available. Thank you both very much. Thank you. I have a, a related question, which perhaps I'll just jump in. Um, one of the things that people experiencing homelessness share in common is extreme poverty in many cases. And in many of these cases, this extreme poverty is linked to the inadequacy of income assistance programs in, in provinces here in Canada. Um, in provinces like Alberta and other provinces, the shelter allowances that are provided as part of these income assistance programs are just inadequate in comparison to the cost of, uh, of housing. Are these systems, these income assistance programs, social assistance programs, are, are they part, are they one of the systemic housing issues that um, could be addressed from the perspective of the right to housing? Or is it being seen differently? So I see it as part of the problem, part of the housing affordability challenge and crisis we face, but it's not exactly clear if this is, to many people, if this is a housing issue uh, or if this is an income security issue. I think that's a really great question. And I think it, it could be um, a really important piece of the systemic um, issues question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that Michelle um, actually jump in on this if you don't mind me putting you on the spot uh, because I think she's got a, a, a fantastic uh, and unique perspective from her her time at Canada Without Poverty. The one thing the one thing that I'll say just for what it's worth from um, sort of my experience doing research on the on the right to food and other social and economic rights, um, income security and and yeah, income is is consistently comes up in the context of conversations about the gap between the sort of theory and uh, practical existence of social and economic rights when you talk about the right to food in a lot of contexts. Um, what, often, uh, what often quickly follows is a conversation about income. Uh, and governments really like to do sort of in the context of food, they like to do, you know, urban gardens and you know, all of the, you know, they want to talk about food deserts and like location of grocery stores and without sort of talking about the elephant in the room, which is people need money to buy food that is going to sustain them and meet nutritional requirements and cultural requirements, et cetera. And I think there's a, there's a version of that conversation in, in can less so in Canada as it relates to health, but in many other countries as it relates to health. And there's a version of that conversation for housing as well. So Michelle, maybe do you want to jump in on that? 
Sure. Not to put me on the spot or anything. <laughs> um, it, what I will say is this, is that there is so clearly a connection between income support and the right to housing, right? Like it's very, very clearly there. Um, it's not the only piece that's there, right? Because, um, because as we know, there's so much wrapped up in the right to housing, right? Accessibility, um, um, the way disproportionately some groups are facing uh, the housing crisis differently than others, Indigenous populations, for example. Um, so I would say um, around the income support question, I mean, it's not the only answer that income support needs to be changed, but it is a deep, deep part of the right to housing. Um, often people talk about these human rights concepts, and they often talk about it more in the context of what economic, social, and cultural rights mean in relationship to civil and political rights. And that's this idea of interdependence. But at the same time, too, I think economic, social, cultural rights are inter interdependent upon one another, right? You can't really recognize the right to food until you recognize the right to social security. And then that's also deeply integrated within the right to food, right? An individual, as we all know here, but an individual might be foregoing, um, foregoing you know, food in order to pay rent <laughs> or, you know, all three of those pieces work together really deeply and the right to health comes into play too here. Um, so I don't have an easy answer <laughs> for you, except to say that um, income support reform, major, major income support reform is really, really desperately needed. Um, I'm just thinking back um, in a conversation I was just having yesterday with someone who was pointing out that the um, rates that people on, sorry, I'm going to use very Ontario examples too, because, because I'm in Ontario, but what the, the benefits that people with disabilities receive on ODSP, on Ontario Disability Support Program, um, are so much lower than what the government consider to be an adequate income in the CERB benefit. Um, and I think that a lot of folks were kind of caught by surprise there. Um, and honestly, I just don't think that the government thought that people in social assistance would respond, <laughs> period, to that. Um, anyway, I could talk about income support for hours and hours and hours, but I will leave it just to say, absolutely, there are intersections. It might be that there's a really strong systemic claim to tie together the right to housing and income support um, with them, some really, really cool and strong international human rights-based arguments. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question in the chat here asking, what can an average person do to support affordable housing being made available to those who need it? That's a great question. Uh, I, I can, I'm happy to start and, and hand it over to Michelle. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an issue like any other that requires um, capturing the attention of governments that are uh, bombarded with uh, asks uh, of, of a lot on a variety of issues day in and day out. So I think um one of the most um, effective strategies is to make sure that this is an issue that consistently makes it to the top of the list for any um, government's uh, top of the list of problems they need to solve. Uh, and so that requires constant advocacy, um, constantly being a squeaky wheel, working with others who are willing to um, and able to um, do that advocacy work and continue to bring public attention to the issue. Um, uh, so that's sort of the, the most obvious thing that comes to mind. Obviously, you know, there are sort of discrete ways where, um, you know, people can be helpful. And, and I just think of sort of, for example, the um, campaign that um, Michelle's organization and my organization worked on, um, uh, around the, the um, arrears and eviction um, issue on account of arrears, we had a campaign, uh, so signing on to those types of things and, and spreading the word about that. Um, those are sort of the most obvious things that come to mind uh, from my, my perspective. Michelle, is there anything you want to add to that? That's a great question. And, you know, for me, just listening to today's presentation, I'm just reminded about how important it is to 
um, be mindful and, and acknowledge the systemic drivers of many of these issues and just keeping these conversations um, going and having these conversations about the systemic causes of, of these um, issues like homelessness is, is one way that we can um, help shift the, the cultural perspectives on, on, um, on housing in, in Canadian society. I see a hand. Uh, oh, Star, Star Smith. Smith has their hand up. Go ahead, Star. On the grassroots level, which is basically where I am, I have found in the last, well, during COVID, actually, that the uh, the meetings that are are had prior to committee and prior to council meetings. And what I'm talking about is the meetings with the applicants or developers for new projects. If you can attend all of them and make yourself a nuisance, the political will is there and you make small steps forward. And I am always amazed at how few people depute. So, in fact, I was about to write. Uh, a memo to Alyssa uh, asking if we could have some representatives from CIRA to come to various ones that are trampling human rights, which most of them do. And the excuses and the, the deaf nature of political statements are quite astounding. You have to continually pull them back. Recently, we're in the middle of, we got a gift from LPAT that they passed a, a totally new secondary plan for the Christie site, which is the site of where they made biscuits in the West End of Toronto. Um, and it's, I think it's 26 hectares. It's going to be a city within a city, another one, 25 plus years in the building. And it's been changed so many times, I can't tell you. And every time there's a change, the towers get taller. Um, they, meaning the applicants, pressured the board, LPAT, to move this forward because, of course, we need to do it faster. And so they passed it with a codicil that they can only get their building permits going and go to the next level in conjunction with the, the master transportation, the transportation master plan. Well, it wasn't written yet. So we went back and visited the transportation people who are making the plan. And we've, you know, some of them are small, but we went for, to a wider sidewalk. We pointed out that there were no drop off zones, even though there was no parking in the area. There's no loading zones anywhere. There's no access for work vehicles to get in and out of the complex because at the moment, um, People who are building high-rise buildings don't want to um, build any more parking than absolutely necessary because it's expensive underground, especially when you're building near the lake, which this is. So we've managed to get, and, and we have accessibility now in the transportation plan mentioned a number of times. It wasn't there a month ago. So... But again, you've got two, three people involved. Um, some people will come once and depute at committee and then committee ignores them. So they go away. They don't go forward and depute again at council. But we have woken up um, a couple of councillors and who are not happy with this. But, you know, so I invite anybody listening who is concerned about it. It's a long term view. And I started exclusively to be part of the affordable housing aspect. And even if it isn't really affordable, my thinking is it will serve a new uh, tier of the population, the upwardly more mobile young who can maybe afford that so-called affordable housing, opening up um, the units below and creating some sort of supply and demand. I'll close by one more thing. We had a mayor called Sewell. I think he was back in the 80s. I wasn't even living in Toronto then. But he was heavily involved in the cooperative housing um, 
situation. He was also, and he, he worked out all of the financing, which has just, we're working out again because the, the 50 years was up. But he also told me another thing. He said, developers promised at that point, as did landlords, that they would build 17,000 new rental units. And they didn't. The 17,000 became 1,700. And so, in other words, they actually created a supply problem, which they have now benefited from. So it gets a bit complicated. And that's where we're at now. There needs to be some, some more um, input. And we get strange reactions from city staff, too. We had one planner say, well, you know, if we don't give the, the leaseholder, in this case, it's for Eglinton and Young, well, maybe they'll walk away from the deal. Well, so what? You know, this is a billion plus billions dollar de deal for 300 years. It's a city, at least because the city owns that land. Well, there'll be another one in line. But that's the thinking. You know, it's, it's well, they're powerful and rich, so they must be right or they must be able to do something bad to me if I don't go along with them. So it's back full circle to the the concept that even if you don't think you have something to say that it will shatter the earth, come anyway, make your comments anyway. They are very valuable and keep coming. That's it. Thank you, Star. That's, that's, that's great um, advice, advice and encouragement to us all to do just what you're saying. In time to thank our two presenters, Michelle and Alyssa, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We all really appreciate it. And I'm just really encouraged by your leadership on this issue. And, and um, I feel I've learned a lot just listening to your presentations today, as I assume many others have as well. So thank you so much.